There is a risk that we come to rely too much on AI. We stop upskilling ourselves and we stop using our brain. You know, I'm very hopeful that each one of us will do the right thing, will make the right trade-off and are on the side of benefit. Hi, welcome to Unmatched, the podcast that gives you an exclusive behind-the-scenes access to industry leaders who fearlessly embrace change, pivot from their comfort zones, and smash their glass ceilings. Pankaj, welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you here today. I'm delighted to be here with you, Oana. We will have a lot of fun over the next hour. Yes, I'm looking forward. And I have to start by saying that I have been waiting for this moment for a long, long time. Ever since we met a few years ago and we uh, briefly collaborated on a very exciting uh, wearables project that you um, are very aware about, um, I always wanted to have this opportunity to spend some time with you and ask you um, questions about your your journey, your professional journey, your experience in, in, in tech. So I'm really excited that I get the chance to do that today. Juana, you, you're very creative. You are a good marketeer. I'm happy to be here with you. I'm happy to be talking about what we have done together over the last few years. So let's jump in and I know your story. Um, I know who you are, but let's tell our listeners Tell us who you are, Pankaj. You know, I've been an entrepreneur. I'm becoming an entrepreneur. I've been an inventor. I'm becoming an investor. So to double click on that, as an entrepreneur, I've had the good privilege to start to grow a number of businesses inside big companies, inside Intel and Qualcomm. My last role was starting, founding the wearable business at Qualcomm and growing it into a healthy nine-digit franchise. My mission at Qualcomm was to connect every man, every woman, every child, every pet with a wearable. And over the last decade, we have made very good progress. Now, as an entrepreneur, I'm working with many, many startups. I'm helping them turn ideas to products and products to businesses. I'm helping them create new franchises. Over the last two or three decades, as an inventor, we did many pioneering things. You know, we created new silicon. We created new products. We created new use cases. We brought new experiences to different segments in the industry. Now, as an investor, I'm having the time of my life working with uh, CEOs and founders and helping them grow, helping them bring new ideas to life. So you can think of my journey as an entrepreneur turned entrepreneur, an inventor turned investor, and I'd love to talk more about it. I, I love that. I think it's so fantastic, this journey that you've had over the span of two or three decades, I would say. And I have to confess something. I've secretly loved your mission statement since day one, since I've met you. Um, and I've known about it because it was stated on, on your LinkedIn profile. And I was always curious to ask you this. How did you come up with that mission statement of connecting everyone in the world around this idea of technology? How did that come to life for you? We have to go, go back a long, long time ago. You know, I was born in India. I grew up in Jaipur, also known as the Pink City. Have you been there, Oana? No, unfortunately not. I have never been to India. It's one of the the, the, the places that are still on my bucket list. Uh, you, should, you should cross out that bucket list soon. You know, so the first time I left home was to go to undergrad. I went to the number one engineering school in the country in India. It was called the University of Roorkee. We had 7,500 students. The, the university was top-notch. Top-notch in engineering, top-notch in science and technology, and yet we did not have computers. When I was going from sophomore to junior, that's when we got the first computers on the campus, and it was very exciting. Actually, my thesis was in robotics, which was unheard of at the time. You know, these were the pre-wireless days. These were the pre-computing days. Now we take this for granted 
if I have to call you, I have you on my speed dial. At that time, we relied on landlines. If I had to call my family, I had to go to a place. I had to go to this building and place what we called a trunk call. A trunk call meant you, you gave the number, you gave the location, and then the infrastructure would try to call that number, get hold of my family. Under normal circumstances, a standard call would take about 12 hours. There was a lightning option that took 30 to 60 minutes. And it was very funny, uh, Oana, the place had runners. If I had to make a trunk call, I had to give them my schedule for the day. What do you mean runners? As in people running? People running, yes. So they would have my schedule. They would connect. They would have an ETA. You, you know, it will connect in 30 minutes or 60 minutes. They'll go running to my dorm, to my class, find me, and then I had to come running. And finally, I'll be able to talk to my parents, my family. It cost a lot of money. You, you know, I, I was literally watching time as I was talking. I couldn't afford more than two or three minutes. How things have changed, right? Th this is the pre-connected era. Then you had to go to a place. Now with cell phones, I can call you anytime, instantaneously. So going through that experience at the best university in India made me realize that it doesn't have to be this way. It, it literally motivated me to do something about it, to connect people. And that became my rallying cry so many years ago. You know, I was fortunate. Uh, I did well at school. I was fortunate to get into many, many universities in the US. I landed at the University of Michigan. And as I was flying in from India, my first time flying outside the country, my first time watching snow, by the way, when I landed, uh, there was only one thing I could remember. What can I do to connect people, to connect lives? So that's how it started. I can I can almost picture that moment as you were traveling to the U.S., you know, this young, ambitious young man, you know, having all these ideas um, already at that very young age. It's quite amazing to see how how early you found your calling. And I'm curious to know when when you when you get to the U.S., with all this, all these ideas and all these dreams about connecting people, how did this time shape you as a person? What were the things that you experienced at the time in this foreign country that that transformed the way that you were looking at life and, and, and the world? Yeah, no, so I came to the University of Michigan. I did well. My master's thesis was actually in AI. There's a lot of talk about AI now, but I was thinking about AI then. You know, because my thesis was in AI, my first job was in AI. I worked at Navistar International, where every truck was designed to specification. And so we used artificial intelligence to, to manage the whole system. We, we'll talk more about AI. But wait, 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 I need to understand this. 30 years ago, you were thinking and working on AI. How is that possible? We just barely heard about this a few months ago, literally. The world has learned about the power of AI literally a few months ago. And you're saying that you were working on this 30 years ago. How is that possible? Yeah, Oana, believe it or not, AI has been around for a long time. Actually, in the 1950s, a bunch of computer scientists started working on AI and were using data to finesse the algorithm and make make machine think like a human mind. Many things happened since then. You know, we, we'll talk about this later in the hour. But yes, that's how it started. After Michigan, I went to Wharton School of Business. Again, very good school. When I was going to Wharton, that's where the World Wide Web came about. I went to Wharton from 94 to 96. And the Netscape IPO happened in the summer of 95, right? So that was the coming of the web. That was the beginning of people getting connected. So over the next three decades, over the last three decades, I've had the good fortune of getting in early, starting new businesses, growing them to hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And it has been a fascinating ride. Let, let's start with the first decade. Tell me more about it, because I'm, I'm really interested to sort of create a picture of how were those exciting times? You know, when everything was happening in tech and you were right at the center of it, how was that time for you? Yeah, Oana, my, um, my career has literally evolved with how the internet has grown. So, you know, the first decade at Intel, we moved the industry 
from a desktop PC to a laptop PC. Remember, I had come to the US thinking I want to connect people. Many of us had a desktop PC. When you have a desktop PC, you have to go to your desk. You have to go to a place. You have to go to your den to access the internet. But inherently, you and I are mobile. We, we don't like sitting around. We are always moving around. So we made Wi-Fi ubiquitous. We moved people from the desktop to the laptop. Now you could access the internet wherever you are wherever you could sit down you had a lap for your laptop people started accessing the internet in a train on a plane at starbucks on a beach you could access the internet wherever you are that connected many many more people than was possible with a desktop we made laptop pc ubiquitous we made wi-fi ubiquitous that was a very exciting time the next decade we moved from the laptop to mobile. You know, at that time, a tablet was mobile. A handheld was mobile. The first smartphones were mobile. With a laptop, you could access the internet wherever you are sitting down. Once we moved you to mobile, you were literally taking the internet in your pocket. You could access the internet, you know, standing in a queue. You, you, you could access the internet. You, you, can, you could send email on a beach. You could look at directions while you were on the run. You could access the internet. You could connect always. So we went from sometimes connected with a laptop and Wi-Fi to always connected with Bluetooth and 3G and 4G. Again, the, the laptop connected maybe 500 million people around the world. With mobile, we connected billions of people around the world. Going back to my mission, connecting people connecting lives. Maybe the last decade has been the most exciting. I moved from Intel to Qualcomm almost a decade ago. I started, I founded the wearables business for Qualcomm. With, with a wearable, connecting is an extension of you. With a wearable, whether it's a glass or a watch or a tracker or a shoe, now you are always connected. You are always in touch with your friends and family. You're living a hel healthier, happier life. And you know, when I look back, my days in Rurki, where I had to go to a place to make a simple phone call and wait 12 hours, to now, where I have multiple wearables on you, it has literally be, been a sea change. As, as we have moved from devices to devices, the internet has evolved. You know, initially, the internet was designed for the PC for the laptop. Then it was designed for your phone. Now increasingly, the internet and app stores are being designed for mobile devices, for IoT devices. I can say, you know, we have 8 billion people now. We have over 4 billion connected. Over 2 billion use at least one of the devices every single day. I can say mission accomplished. I can say we are connected. We are truly connected with each other through these range of devices. And, and uh, you know, that's very exciting. Uh, I'm very proud of playing a role in making this happen. Absolutely. And it's it's such an amazing journey. But before I ask you more questions on that, I'm, I'm looking at your hands and I see that you are truly connected. <laughs> Tell us for the listeners, how many wearables are you wearing today? You know, I have three. God gave me two hands. I use them well. Um, so I have three today. I have the Hublot smartwatch. Hublot is an iconic brand for the watch. At Qualcomm, we worked with them to do a smartwatch. I have the Aura ring. It tracks how well I sleep and makes me a better uh, sleeper. And then I have the Hoop band. This is very good in measuring how active I am. I'm an addict when it comes to devices, and especially wearable devices. And now a cheeky question, because as a marketeer, I think I sometimes uh, struggle with this myself. And I'm very curious about your point of view from a, from a tech perspective and from the perspective of somebody that actually made it all happen in a way. You played a, a role in making this connectivity happen. How is life being connected all the time versus how it was being less connected to devices, but maybe being offline a bit more. What's your 
personal perspective on that apart from the obviously the functional aspects of the easiness of life what's your personal perspective on the level of quality that we're actually connecting at today yeah yeah oana first nobody's telling me to wear these devices you always have the option to go analog any day of the week right i find it difficult to give up my devices because it makes me happier it makes me more productive at work it gives me access to my calendar my email my messaging like that in life i'm always connected to my wife i'm always connected to my 6 year old i can always call them they can always call me i always know where they are in play you know i, I use these devices to interact with my tv and with my gaming console this is how i learn this is how i share it makes me better at what i do so i love it i'm addicted to it i want more of it if you want to take a holiday you can leave them behind would you ever would you ever take a holiday from your devices the question i would ask koana is you know um 5 years ago if i left my wallet and went to the car i would drive back a couple years ago if, if i left my smartphone and drove i would come back Today if I accidentally leave my smartwatch I come back I think that shows what you cannot live without so it has become a part of my life it it is an extension of me it's always with me I mean I totally get it because also that is part of your job for the last 30 years that has been what you've done so um I I was just joking a little bit around I absolutely can see why you would never leave your devices behind I'm really interested in AI and you know this we've had several conversations and <clears throat> you know how how fascinated I am by this topic I'm very interested in figuring out what that means for marketing and seeing how you've had this journey of entrepreneur to entrepreneur inventor to investor across uh, very important tech companies i think that you have a full understanding of what ai can actually do for us and how it can help us so help me out pankaj here and and explain ai to me as, as if i had seen it for the first time as if i'm a 5 year old what do i need to know about ai and how is it going to make my life better Yeah Oana um on your last question I'm sure you have seen on the web Maslow's hierarchy redefined right it's not just food and shelter it's also wifi and internet so I'm not the only one there are many many people who rely but AI you know AI is very interesting AI has been around for maybe 70 years you know um in the 1950s a bunch of computer scientists got together and wrote algorithms and use data to refine algorithms in 1997 all of us have heard about the IBM story you know beating Gary Kasparov right actually Siri you know the first voice assistant came about in 2011 almost 12 years ago maybe it was the first consumer version of ai my master's thesis was ai my first job was ai so ai has been around what has changed over the last 3 or 4 months is how it has come to the forefront chat gpt changed the game you know i almost think of chat gpt as the world wide web if you go to the internet days universities and government they were working on the internet for a long 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 time but the internet as we know it came about with the netscape browser that was the consumer facing interface world wide web and since then we have never looked back you know every one of us uses the web for play and work and all kinds of things chat gpt will have the same effect chat gpt has made the benefits of ai possible for you and i except there is a difference chat gpt is happening much much faster than literally any other consumer application or business application You know we went from 0 to 1 million in 5 days. Even the most popular services we use every day took multiple months. We went from 0 to 100 million in a couple of months. Anytime something is doing a million in 5 days, 100 million in a couple of months, something is going to change. So AI is very exciting. The technology has made lots of strides. 
it is ready for prime time. And this is the right time, Oana, because over 4 billion of us are connected. And we take being connected for granted. Now we want to be smart about it. We want to make, we are looking for that next thing that will make everything we do smarter. That's where generative AI or chatbot-based AI enters the picture. So it's a very exciting time. It's, it's a great time to be alive. It's a great time uh, to be investing. It's a great time to be an entrepreneur. It's a great time to do AI-based marketing, which is where you are going. So this is so exciting. It's it's definitely very exciting, and um, I wanted to share with you something. I'm I'm using ChatGPT in a lot of the processes that I'm and that I'm utilizing on a on a daily basis, especially for this project for Unmatched because I'm doing it as a passion project, and there's not a lot of hours in the day to dedicate to it. Um, I use it as my personal assistant to help me out, summarize transcripts and make all the processes super easy for me and in the last few months i've used it literally every day and so the natural question for me that comes to mind is where is this going because the way i see it is we're going from a very skilled oriented world right you and i have developed our skills over multiple years of, of studying of iterating of testing and learning and growing and failing Whereas now it looks like we're entering this, this phase, this era of, of something else where the skills are not so necessary anymore because there's chat GPT and in general AI to cover for all those skills that we've taken so long to develop. We don't need those skills anymore. We need a different set of skills. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to know what your point of view is with regards to what will be the skills that we will need as marketeers, as professionals, as business people, entrepreneurs like you, to make it through the next phase of work without having to depend on our acquired skills anymore. Yeah, Oana, maybe, maybe we should step back and maybe in layman words describe what is AI and then come to what skills we need, right? You actually asked me this question a couple of weeks ago and I've been thinking about it. You know, if you think about what what makes us us? It's the body, it's the brain or the mind, and it's the heart, right? For the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to use a robot. If, if you go to a manufacturing floor or assembly line, there are lots of robots flying around. And, and by the way, there is a lot of discussion that, you know, we'll all have robots inside our homes and at work to make our lives easier. So let's use the robot. Over the last few years, the robot has become as good as our body. It has two legs, it has two hands, it has dexterous fingers, it can see through cameras. So the repetitive tasks, the manual tasks we do, the manual task you do on an assembly line or in farming or construction or what have you, doing dishes, a robot can do. Those jobs will likely go away. Next, let's go to the mind or the brain. When we talk about artificial intelligence, we are essentially talking about how to do what a brain does. You know, we are going from human intelligence to artificial intelligence. So how do I use my brain? I'm thinking, I'm problem solving, I'm making decisions, I'm looking at data, I'm extrapolating, I'm doing pattern matching, I'm looking at images, and I'm uh, deciphering what is the difference between two images. I'm listening to two different people, two different speeches, and I'm able to tell the difference. When we talk about AI, we are essentially talking about having our machines, having our computers, having our robots replicate what we are using the brain for. The advantage is we get tired, the machine doesn't get tired. Our ability to comprehend data is limited based on how tired we are um, or how much data we are intaking. The machine or the computer doesn't have those limits, right? So what we, how we use the brain today will increasingly get complemented with AI. And that gives us the opportunity to use new ways to use our 
mind and brain. New ways would include, you know, creating all these AI startups. New ways to, would mean coming up with new programs, new algorithms, new ways for our machines to help us. It's literally upskilling how we think about computers. The last piece is the heart. The machine does not have one. There is discussion around natural language where the machine might be able to understand what I'm saying. The machine might be able to speak to me, but, but I think that's, that's a ways out. So our ability to make decisions, not just through our brain, but also through our heart is second to none. This decade, I expect the repetitive functions will be taken over. The AI, the computers will become increasingly uh, proficient in replicating how we use the brain. But it's the combination of the three. It's how we use emotions, how we use heart that will keep you and I that much more um, interesting, that much more valuable. And in business, <laughs> hopefully, and active and doing things. Um, I, I love the explanation. I, I think it's very visual and it's very interesting to understand. And I want to um, connect a little bit to this last point that you mentioned with regards to heart and emotions. And I want to take it to my territory, take it to my, to my marketing territory. You are a great storyteller. You've always been. And you are a good marketer in, in the way that you understand consumers' needs and how products connect to, to consumers. I want to ask you, do you think that maybe this is where marketing needs to focus on as well, on this emotion-driven um, strategy uh, maybe a heart-led strategy, maybe a community-driven strategy more so than in the past. Because with all this data that we have around us, to be able to analyze, interpret, and, and figure out how to use it, I'm just wondering how much of marketing becomes analytical over the next decade, let's say, and how much of it do you think it needs to become more heart to be able to compensate for what AI is bringing to the table? Yeah, well, I, marketing has always been the heart and mind. You know, I'm a recovering marketeer. I have enjoyed the days I spent in marketing. It has always been this combination. Now with AI, the output from the mind is based so much more on data, so much more on analytics. You, you can get so much data and really come come at very sharp recommendations. That actually makes how you bring the heart even more important, even more interesting. You know, I remember uh, one of my managers telling me, you may not remember what I said, but you'll always remember how I made you feel. When I watch a Puma commercial, when I watch a Nike advertorial, when I think about the Apple 1984 ad, I don't remember what the word said. I just remember how invigorated, how excited I was. So it has always been this combination. The what you bring with the heart will carry a whole new meaning now that the mind is complemented by, you know, AI-based analysis. I think it's pretty fantastic that your journey covered so much in the evolution of tech. And I'm just um, sort of like thinking now back to what you said at the beginning that your master thesis 30 years ago was already AI, that your first job was AI. You got to see how that technology developed in front of consumers. You got to be an inventor on the side of, of, of the companies that you've worked for. And now you you are evolving in, in this different role of investor and, and you are helping startups come up with ideas and products and services that use AI to serve consumers in a different way. I would love to know when you think back on this and you reflect on your personal journey and your personal mission of connecting everyone around the world that you've been a, an important part of, and you think about the next 10 years or the next decade, the next era ahead of us, what, what would you hope your contribution to be now in this new role? Oh, Anna, that, that's a simple question. Very, very difficult answer. You know, as an investor, I have the luxury to work not just with one company, with one founder, 
I have the privilege to work with many, many startups, many, many founders. My focus is AI-based startups, both in the consumer space, in the enterprise space. And what I find is every one of these companies is using AI to do some good. I'll give you a couple of examples. In the consumer space, um, I'm working with this company, Personal AI. Personal AI essentially creates an AI persona and this persona helps you remember and recall conversations you had, things you read, movies you watched, books you fell in love with using AI. Um, I'm working with this other company, Scopio. Scopio is helping artists monetize their work through a marketplace. It's, it's bringing the benefits of AI to thousands of artists around more than 100 countries. In the enterprise space, I'm working with startups in health, working with startups in manufacturing, in construction, in mining. In every one of these cases, AI, camera, robotics is helping them become more productive, become more efficient. Things these companies were not able to do just one or two years ago, they're able to do now, right? When I look by the end of the decade, let's say, I think AI, ChatGPT, Google Bard, Meta, Baidu, chatbots from all of these companies will become as ubiquitous as we think of the web today. Every one of us will rely on them for everyday personal things, business things. Oana, you are an early adopter. You are already using ChatGPT every day. Imagine when 8 billion people or 4 billion people are using it every day. I think it will truly transform how we work, how we play, how we live, how we learn, how we share. Learning education is getting uh, revolutionized with, with what AI brings to the table. You, you know, um, um, in my new role, I've been going to Silicon Valley a lot. And just over the last few weeks, as many as 500 startups have been created are born with the goal, with the mission to use AI to change one of these things. Over $25 billion has been invested just over the last three or six months to fund these companies. So I, I think the future is bright. Uh, the future is exciting. AI will become part of our everyday life at work, at home, in the car. You know, we, we talk about EVs and autonomous driving. You cannot do autonomous without AI. And imagine today in the US, the utility, if you own a car, is about 10% because we, we, we normally use the car to go to work and, you know, come back. It is mostly sitting there. It's mostly in the parking lot. It's mostly in the garage. With autonomous driving, that number will change to a much higher number, to maybe 40%, 50%, because the car is being used by many, many people. And, you know, that will change the society we live in, how we relate to one another. So it, it's it's very exciting time, Oana. It's, it's a great time to be alive. It's a great time to be working in AI. For me, it is so much fun. I've never had so much fun. Um, I have never loved someone non-moving as much as I, I love AI. So um, I'm delighted to be doing what I'm doing. It's, it's really cool to hear you say that, to hear this excitement. And it makes me hopeful because I will be honest, for, for a time I was a little bit scared or, or unsure of how the uh, technology would affect our lives. There's a lot of people around me that are are very negative around, you know, the the impact. Somehow I I want to see the positive in it and I want to be optimistic. I think there's a lot of good that it, it can do. At the same time I feel that there's a, there is some danger in it. What's your point of view on that? Uh, on what is the danger that we need to be aware of and how can we as people prepare and be sort of ready? to take on this new challenge ahead of us? You know, there will always be bad actors, but the benefit is so much greater than the cost. If I think about the internet, the web, think about how we lived our lives without the internet and then with the internet, right? The internet came with some bad actors, 
But overwhelmingly, the good that has come up, the business opportunity that has been created, the communities that have been formed have been so much more positive. Again, there are bad actors. Every once in a while, you know, somebody gets hacked, but the benefit is greater than cost. It's, it's no different with AI. Maybe AI, the benefits will be much, much bigger than what the internet brought to us, what mobile brought to us. Um, it has the potential to truly change everything we do. But there are challenges around, you know, bias. AI today is not able to distinguish two people of color or different religions and so on. More work is needed there. There is a risk that we come to rely too much on AI. We stop upskilling ourselves and we stop using our brain and the AI becomes our brain. And especially for children, you know, if they are not developing their cognitive skills, it might backfire. There is a risk that AI makes the haves and have nots, the differences larger, you know, between countries or between age groups. The fact that we know of these challenges, the fact that we also know of the benefits, you know, I'm very hopeful that each one of us, each one of the governments, each one of the companies, each one of the startups will do the right thing, will make the right trade off and are on the side of benefit and avoid these costs. But this is something we have to be cognizant of. And this is something I watch for every day, every company I work with, every discussion I have. What is the biggest learning or biggest learnings that you take in this new new phase um, as you go into this new role of investor and specifically thinking about everything that you've learned over the last three decades in tech? What is it that you want to be aware of as you go into the next decade of your amazing journey? Yeah, Oana, um, as an entrepreneur, I was starting and growing businesses inside big companies. As an entrepreneur and investor, I'm doing it out there in the industry. The context is different, but actually the approach is very similar. You know, things I learned at Intel and Qualcomm, being able to look around corners, being able to take ideas and turn them into products, take products and turn them into businesses, building teams, collaborating across functions, collaborating across companies, collaborating across ecosystem, understanding your customer, understanding your consumer, delighting them, understanding your shareholder, creating value, capturing value. Every one of these things also applies in the startup context. So perhaps my biggest value to the startups I'm working with and founders I collaborate with is the approach you're taking, how you're thinking, how you're solving problems, how you're making decisions with customers, with the ecosystem, with your shareholders. And, you know, bringing that learning, bringing that experience to, to the startup community. It's, it's very exciting. It kind of makes you unmatched. That's what I sort of think about. And I guess I'll share this piece with you now. It's, I think it's that's why Unmatched is coming to life in this form. Because we've spoken quite a few times, you know, that there's been different iterations <laughs> of this idea over the last few months. And I will admit that Unmatched was finally the form that I um, set out to sort of um, bring to life because exactly of, of what you just said. What makes us special is the combination, right, of the body, the mind, and the heart. And it's so unique to each one of us that I feel like that is the message of, of, of this project, right? That this is who you are and this is your amazing journey. And I'm also curious to know, if I speak to you again in 10 years from now, what do you think is going to be your world looking like? And how, how do you think, what, would, what do you think you'll be doing in 10 years from now? Yeah, so first of all, congratulations on launching Unmash the Brand, Unmash the Place to Go To. It is a brilliant idea that the word unmashed, the branding and the image and the ID you have come out with, it's, it's fascinating. It's exciting. Congratulations to you. You know, 10 years from now, I think I'll be doing the same thing. I'm having so much fun working with startups, investing in startups, advising them, 
mentoring them, being on their boards. I cannot think of anything else I could be doing. 10 years from now, I think AI will be in our veins. Everything we do will be infused by AI. There is so much potential. There is so much opportunity that I am doubling down. I'm in it for the next decade. I cannot imagine doing anything else. Then promise me this, that in 10 years, we do another podcast episode, but in person. And we evaluate the status of AI then, and, and we do a follow-up of this conversation. What do you think? When I'm done, uh, I was hoping we'll do one every year, but, but this has been so much fun. If you want me to wait 10 years, I'm happy to do that. <laughs> no, just joking. We will do one every year, but at least 10 years from now, we, do, we need to do a celebratory episode and, and look back and see how the world has changed in the last, uh, in the last decade. That, that would be fun. Yes. Um, I hope you don't go back to this episode and uh, bring out my predictions and uh, rate and rank them. Absolutely. Pankaj, thank you so much for taking the time to share all of this with us. It's always great to speak to you and you have a unique way, I would say an unmatched way of bringing stories to life, especially when it's about tech, which you would think it's, it's really analytical and it's not exciting, but you've made it very exciting and I'm very hopeful and I'm very excited about what's coming. So thank you once again, and I'm looking forward to speak to you again soon. Thank you, Anna. Thanks for having me. Good luck, Unmatched. Thank you for tuning into Unmatched. Remember, building an unmatched brand is not just about success. It's not about popularity. It's about creating something truly remarkable that reflects who you are and what you stand for. So keep pushing yourself to go beyond what you think is possible. Keep taking risks, challenging yourself, and never settle for standard. And if you like what you hear, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest episodes. Until next time, keep being unmatched.